Hey, happy Veterans Day, everybody. This is Steve with Real Progressives. Tonight, we got three issues we're going to talk about in rapid succession. First thing is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez running for uh, Congress, gets elected to Congress, and finds out, son of a bitch, it's expensive as hell to live in Washington, D.C. The second thing we're going to talk about is this universal basic income that seems to keep coming back and coming back and coming back from well-meaning progressives. The last thing is Veterans Day in and of itself. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on um, you know, as a nation and more importantly as a movement how we're addressing returning veterans and we're dealing with uh, their integration into society. <clears throat> So let's start at the top here real quickly. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's 29 years old, um, worked in a restaurant, and now all of a sudden finds herself elected to Congress and finds out that in order to serve her term for this gap between when she actually gets the job, uh, when she actually starts receiving a paycheck, and when she's now elected, it's like three grand a month just to survive there. And let me tell you, Coming from the Washington, D.C. area, I can tell you it is extremely expensive to live there. Now, it's real easy to say, hey, you know, this is just a bougie girl. She's tone deaf. She doesn't realize there's a lot of people struggling. But I want to talk about this for just a minute. How many of us want to run for office? Not many. And for those that do choose to step up to run for office, many of us don't have any money. Okay? The people that do have money are the ones that tend to run for office and they tend to not care about such things as $3,000 a month for rent. They tend to own million dollar townhomes in DC already. Or maybe they own $25 million houses in New York and in Arkansas and in New York City and in all over the place, right? So let's say Rodolfo Cortez or let's say Kenneth Mejia got elected. Now what happens? Do you think they have 3000 a month to spend on an apartment in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill? I assure you, they do not. So we really need to think about this. Housing in America is extremely expensive. There is no options there for regular people. Regular people are cut out of this that's why it's such an elitist crowd that gets elected to office. That's why regular people, you and I, not only we can't afford to really campaign, but then once we get elected, we can't afford to live what we have to do to do it. And it's not that much money. It may sound great. It may sound like a wonderful thing, but I assure you, there are expenses there. And you need to think about this because we want regular people to get elected to Congress. We want regular people to be able to get elected as senators. We don't want it to be the rich constantly doing this, right? Am I right? So I, I say this because it's all the rage to be maybe a little cooler than we have to be, maybe a little edgier than we have to be, to sit there, oh yeah, fuck so-and-so. And I'm telling you right now, Stop worrying about that and start thinking about if you ran for office, don't care about anybody else, if you ran for office, could you afford to move into an area where you could do your job effectively in Washington, D.C.? I just want to ask you that question. If you can't answer that a question with an unequivocating yes, then you really ought to think about what the real problem is. Now, I did hear something very powerful the other day. Somebody that I was debating with about this said, you know something, I agree with you, Steve, but there's one thing that I would do differently if I were in her shoes. I would live in the street or something like that in protest of the rates of housing. I would live in the streets as an activist for this short period. Now, mind you, it is the dead of winter coming up through, so I'm not sure that would be advantageous, but whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, it is an opportunity lost. This was an opportunity as an activist to put forward the struggle of the people she's representing in Brooklyn. So you could look at it both ways, but I'm telling you right now, look at it 
beyond her. Look at it as yourself. If you are running for office and start asking yourself, why is rent so damn expensive in this country? Why is it, you know, let, let's talk about what it takes to run for office. I did not run for office because my student loans are so far in arrears that my credit is in the 400s. Okay? I did not run for office because I had child support in arrears from when I had lost my job previously. I mean, I'm paying my child support, but the point is it was in arrears. Life's a son of a bitch. And then you go run for office and then you've got some loser coming after you, checking out your background saying, well, I understand he uh, uh, drives a Subaru or I understand he, uh, and all of a sudden the little mouthpieces start doing this shit. And it's like, do you really want to run for office if that's what you've got to deal with? Seriously, think about what I'm saying to you. Think about what I'm saying to you. Do you want your family drugged through the mud because some petty, worthless piece of shit wants to play gotcha politics? I know I don't, and that's why I didn't. I'd rather be out here advocating, unfortunately. But you know what, though? I can tell you right now, I'd be a goddamn good politician. I'd be a great senator. I'd be a great congressman. There are many people out there that would be great congressmen, great congresswomen, great senators, you name it. But they will never, ever put their family in the way of people that just sit there and go, oh, she's this and he's that. Never. Why would you? Why would you? I don't want to deal with it. It's bad enough to deal with social media trolls. I can't even imagine what it'd be like having people picking through your closet. I can't even imagine what it would be like to have worthless people digging into your past. Okay? I mean, seriously. And so then she's like, I don't know how to do this. I can't afford a, a friggin' room. Maybe I should put a GoFundMe together. And what happens? The first fucking thing that happens is there's people slamming her. It's like, you know what? You don't have to like her, but start thinking like a human being as to what would happen if you ran for office. All right. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, moving on. Next subject is a universal basic income. This subject is, is, is really a very difficult one for me because I feel like it's such an open and shut case that it shouldn't even be debated anymore. Well-meaning people that don't know economics come to the debate filled with emotion, filled with a lack of economic understanding, filled with a word called should. It should, it should, shoulda, shoulda, shoulda. And they don't understand the economic underpinnings of what they're saying. They know the shoulds, but they don't know the mechanism. And so the shoulds drown out the reality. So you're sitting there as somebody who is advocating, lovingly advocating for progressive policies, but you're standing there as one person against a drone army of people that have been brainwashed by the media and by neoliberals that a UBI is somehow or another this magic pill that solves all the problems of the world. It does not. It doesn't. So I want to use something that I've used before to paint this picture so you can understand this. In some school districts, they started trying to issue school vouchers. Now, as you know, schools are not covered by federal law. This is kind of a state-by-state -state thing, right? Way, way back when, the law was never set at the federal level, so there is no right to an education. This is terrible stuff here, folks, right? Well, people want to do this whole school voucher thing. Well, a school voucher, by any definition, is a UBI. It's a UBI. Everybody gets one. Now, if you're rich and you have a basic income of $5,000 for your child and you say, well, shit, I think I'm going to add another ten grand and send my kid to this school. Everybody's even, but everybody's not even still. You haven't really solved the problem. You've just thrown money at it. That's why you'll see so many people when it comes to reparations 
say, don't just tell me it's a dollar figure. It's not just a dollar figure. Here you go, black and brown people. Here is a, here's this reparation dollar figure. Now go be good people and never have a problem again. Oh my God, what's wrong with you? We gave you your reparations. Now shut up. That right there is the UBI once again on steroids. The UBI solves absolutely nothing. It has no price anchor. It has no nothing. Okay, nothing. It's called status quo. And it's worse because many, many moons ago, a guy that most people don't pay attention to anymore, they don't even realize he existed. His name was Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman was a right-wing lunatic. This guy was a charlatan, a liar, a scumbag, the worst of all of them. He was from the Chicago school. And he was the one that came up with the lie of quantity theory of money, which everybody still believes. It's long been debunked, but he came up with quantity theory of money. And he made everybody shake in their boots when they thought that the federal government would spend, if it spent money, it would create massive inflation. It would devalue your dollar. It would this, it would that. And it will not go away, just like the UBI won't go away. More myths and legends that literally handicap our entire movement. Well, the fear of inflation was set in place by none other than Uncle Milty, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman and his right-wing libertarian strain of evil decided that maybe the only thing really wrong with capitalism was we needed more capitalism. So let's go ahead and drop money on the people. We'll call it a basic income or a reverse income tax, helicopter money, whatever. We just dump this money into the equation. And the problem is when you don't have enough production to meet demand, you create inflation, okay? There is nothing productive, period, period about throwing money out there. This is not to say that we're poor shaming or, or disability shaming or anything else like that. What we're saying is, is that the reason for a basic income was always to fatten the wallets of, of capitalists, to offset downturns to make them money. But what do the poor really need? Think about this for a minute. Do you think the poor need pieces of paper or do you think the poor need food? Do you think the poor need shelter? Do you think the poor need clothing? Do you think the poor need electricity? Do you think the poor need transportation? Do you think the poor need childcare? Do you think the poor need a host of things that have nothing to do with pieces of paper? The pieces of paper are an intermediary to getting all the things I just said. So what the right wing wants to do and will be very successful at doing because we are not paying attention is they will convince you through Silicon Valley and other neoliberals that a UBI is the solution to your problems. We'll just throw money at you. But it is not. It is inflationary by its very definition. And then if the prices rise... And the UBI, just like we've seen with Social Security, doesn't rise too. And it would need to rise way high. We're not talking about just $1,000 a month, folks. We are talking about a significant $2,000 a month or more level in order for that to happen. And then here's the other bad, bad thing. Now, if everybody's getting $2,000 a month, what do you think employers will do? Employers will absolutely offset their wage scale based on the UBI. There is nothing whatsoever to prevent this. And this is the right wing. It's it, like in writing. This is what they want to do. They're begging. They're praying. They're like, dear Lord Jesus, whatever. Dear Lord Jesus, please let them beg for a UBI so that we can get rid of FDR's entire New Deal. We're begging you, Lord. Let them 
please be dumb enough to go for the UBI. We're begging you. We'll make it sound so good that they'll all go for it because that's what we do. And so now all of a sudden, yeah, give me my UBI. And then they start saying, well, that program's wasteful. Let's get rid of it. Well, that program's wasteful. Let's get rid of that. That program's wasteful. Let's get rid of that. Now, all of a sudden, you've got nothing. And you felt so good about your UBI, didn't you? You felt like a king for a minute. For about 15 seconds, you felt like a god. You were about ready to strike a flex and go, you got your UBI and then nothing. So it sucks being the progressive guy that tells you about the real economic underpinnings of this because it goes against the tide. That means I constantly end up making more enemies than friends because everybody snowed under with the joy of the UBI. They don't know what it means. They don't care what it means. They just like the sound of it. UBI, it's a three letter word. Man, does it sound good. Here's the problem. We already have a basic income. We have social security. And social security is not going broke at all. It's all keystrokes, okay? Bernie Sanders ran on expanding social security. We can lower the age, we can raise the COLA cost of living. We can go ahead and include different brackets. We can make it so that the basic income covers certain cases that you would like to see covered. The flip side to that is we need a federal job guarantee because today we have no answer, no answer whatsoever for downturns in the economy to prevent involuntary unemployment. To prevent involuntary unemployment. So a federal job guarantee is king right now. And thank God there are people that are actively fighting to push this forward. Sadly, if you look at the roots of where a UBI comes from, we're not, even, even Martin Luther King, I mean, her, is not a UBI, it's been a federal job guarantee. People want the right to work. And people say, well, what about automation? Automation is the first thing that comes up. Well, you know, man, when they when the robots take over, everything's going to be gone. You know, and I keep thinking about Captain Kirk, that dude that doesn't do a job. Captain Kirk, that guy that still seems to keep coming to work every day. And Scotty Bones, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor. You know, and Chekhov and Sulu, and O'Hara, all of them are showing up with their jersey on, ready for work, man. Stardate. Who made the walkie-talkie? Who? Oh, the robots. Ah, snap. So what are all those people doing on the USS Enterprise? I don't know. Working. Working. Okay? But more to the point, we're nowhere near Star Trek. I mean, we're not even in the vicinity. And here's the best part. The part that the UBI folks don't even try to get at. The boomer era, the huge boom. They're all retiring from the workforce. We're going to have a huge vacuum of talent. Huge vacuum of people that aren't working. Now what do you do? How are we going to meet the productive demands of all those retired seniors? Remember what I told you about inflation. I told you inflation is demand outpacing supply. And all of a sudden you've got competition for scarce resources again. And that will drive that up. So when we talk about a federal job guarantee, we're not just talking about here, here, here's a job, now dig a hole, fill a hole, dig a hole, fill a hole. We're talking about meaningful work, because I don't know, I wish it was light out here, I'd show you the area I'm in. There's plenty of work to be done right here just to make it look decent. Pretend like that's all you're doing is cleaning up. There's more to it than that, but let's just say, you're setting the wage floor, this helps all labor. Now, 
You can pick up and leave anytime you like and have a job wherever you like. And when you want to re-enter into the private sector workplace, you're not going into it as an unemployed person. You're going into it as a person with a job. They can no longer hold the fact that you haven't worked in 18 years over your head. You've now held a job. Think about what I'm saying. Very important. The job guarantee sets the wage floor. Now the private sector will have to meet or beat that. It's better than a $15 an hour minimum. Now you have literally said, I don't have to come work for you, dude. I can do the job guarantee. You better meet or beat this target. And guess what? It comes with all the bennies. I even have health care. I even have retirement. Beat that. It's got tuition assistance, whatever, right? The point is, UBI is fool's gold. And it sounds good. And people, good people, friends, are oftentimes on the wrong side of this. And you fight about it, and you don't want to fight about it. There's no reason to fight about it. But it is a fight because... When you don't pay attention to the underlying economic narrative and you're just going based on your feelings, it's extremely difficult to have a fair conversation. When you don't bother to read the links, it's very hard to have a, a, a fair debate. If you're not really paying attention to the underlying factors, there's not much that's going to ever happen. You're going to be talking right past each other, right? And I think probably the most difficult one is that I talk about economics every single day of my life. I talk to economists every single day of my life. And when I talk to people, they act like this is the first go around that I've never talked about this to anyone before a day in my life. And it's like Groundhog Day. It's like we got to start from ground zero as if, man, it's all on the table. Man, we're going to have this debate. Like it's all, it's a fresh debate. It's never been had before. We're going to do it again. And, and it's like, okay, you know, okay. But could you at least read these links here so you can understand that automation's really not doing a whole lot to us right now. It's not increasing productivity the way we thought it would. It's not doing any of those things. And I'm pretty sure that the wheel maker for the old stage coaches was bitching and moaning when the steel radial came out. I'm pretty sure he was not a happy camper. And I can only imagine the dude that was playing with the abacus really despised computers. He was friggin' hell-bent pissed when they came out with the first calculator. And I'm pretty damn sure that the tailor and seamstress that were very, very gifted were really pissed off when the sewing machine came out and took them right out of the game. Folks, work is constantly going to be redefined. It's a fact of life. Change is constant. Stop trying to jump the shark. We're nowhere near anything like that. We're not even in the... We're not even close. We're not even close. And listen, in order for us to survive the apocalypse, we're going to have to do some crazy stuff to get past this climate change thing. And the robots are not going to be the ones to save us. I'm telling you right now, friends, we need a job guarantee. And I'm going to tip my hat to those who want to expand Social Security and then raise the bottom of Social Security up so that people can live comfortably on Social Security. It's important. But it's also important to understand that if demand outpaces supply, you will have inflation. All right. Last subject tonight is Veterans Day. Veterans Day is a very, very important day for so many reasons. We've probably had some good wars somewhere. I'm just kind of stumped on where. But we've had a lot of bad wars. And we keep creating a lot of very, very distraught young men and women with PTSD. And they keep coming back to America 
and they've got nothing to do. They're, they're relegated back to regular society. They've been trained to kill. They've been trained for hostile environments, and now all of a sudden you dump them out there, and people don't want them to work. There's nothing for them to do. They're literally sitting there destitute. They can't sleep at night. They're hooked on opioids that they were given during their time in the military. Folks, we got a problem in America. We have a problem in America with the PTSD and opioid addiction. We have a major problem here. And there's no point in celebrating Veterans Day when we don't acknowledge that we take piss poor care of our veterans. Our returning veterans are treated horribly. The VA system doesn't work nearly as well as it should or could and is underfunded terribly and it's poorly managed. Folks, the one thing that we can't run out of is pieces of paper money. We can't run out of it. So don't tell me we're too broke to fully fund the VA system. And don't tell me we can't have a VA system for every single American citizen. And don't tell me we can't take care of immigrants as well. Because we don't have a dollar shortage. We may have a resource shortage. Or we may have a productivity shortage. A supply shortage. But a demand problem? Think about this. If you have demand for a product... Think, think this is going to be the most logical moment of your life. If you have demand, increased demand, and you have to ramp up production to meet that demand, I'm just spitballing with you here for a minute. If you have increased demand, and you have to sit there and increase production, Hook a brother up. What does that do to the economy? I, 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 just, just take a minute. Think it through. Think it through for a minute. It, sometimes it baffles me that the right wing gets so pissed off at, at immigrants coming in this country. But then I realize, I realize the reason why is because y'all been spoon fed dog turds. Those white dog turds, you know, the fuzzy ones. You've been spoon-fed white dog turds of economic lies. And so they believe that the nation is broken, that we need to take care of our veterans first. We need to take care of our own first. And they see clearly that we're not. They see clearly that we're not taking care of them. And they're right. Do you realize this is where we fuck up as progressives? Do you realize that conservatives are absolutely correct that we don't take care of our returning veterans? We don't. We don't take care of them at all. So they are right when they say something's amiss. And then they see these people coming from outside and they see us taking care of them. And they say something's not right with this. I understand their impulse. You should understand their impulse too. I'm not saying if 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 the economic lies that you all have been spoon fed about your tax dollar, your hard earned tax dollar paying for shit, then they've got a point. Now all of a sudden it's like, well, I want my taxes to go here and I want my taxes to go there. Folks, this is why this lie is so pernicious and why we must eradicate it. Your vets are not taken care of by your tax dollar either. Immigrants coming in this nation are not taken care of by your federal tax dollar. Israel is not taken care of by your tax dollar. Folks, every time the government spends, it spends new money into existence. Folks, not sometimes, not I, you know, in certain circumstances. Not maybe once in a blue moon. 
every single time the federal government spends money, it spends a new dollar into existence every single time. A government spent dollar is spent one time by the government. And when the government receives it back in a tax, it deletes it because that's the cycle of the dollar. That's the way it works. They sometimes will raise taxes to stave off inflation, and sometimes they'll lower taxes to spur the economy. It's this even flow thing. The problem is, is that they'll go ahead and cut taxes on the wealthy. And then what do the wealthy do? Stock buybacks. The wealthy start doing all these pernicious evil things that further extract wealth and, and value from us, we the people, the labor. So you wanna talk about tax, tax cuts aren't hurting or bankrupting the nation at all. That's not what's happening. But because you believe your taxes are, are what is paying for stuff. Because you believe if we don't tax the shit out of those rich people, we're not going to be able to provide services for each other. Because you've been fed a pile of horse shit. Everyone ends up suffering. And the rich laugh because they think Warren Buffett can come out here and say, I'll tell you how to fix the problem. You just raise my taxes a little bit here and it'll solve everything. They would love to raise their taxes just a little bit to make you believe that they're still God, that their money is what it takes for you and I to have nice things. That's how they retain God status. But the way to make them irrelevant and serve each other is to realize that the money is public money. It's created every time our Congress authorizes spending. And it is deleted and purged and shredded, digitally shredded, whatever you want to call it. Every time it's received as a tax. Think about that for a minute. The reason why our veterans are not getting served is quite frankly because we believe that we have to make tough choices. Now, if we just cut the military spending over here, we can have health care. Because it makes so much sense. I get it. It makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm sitting there, I'm broke right now. I'm unemployed and I'm looking, I'm like, man, I only got this amount of money. God, I got to make some tough choices. I got to cut something so I can pay my mortgage. I got mm, to cut something else so I can pay this. I gotta cut something to pay for my medical bills or whatever. Federal government doesn't have to do that. Federal government neither has dollars nor doesn't have dollars. It creates them every time like it's the god of the dollar. It writes these things into law. When they write it into law, they keystroke deposits into the treasury's account and then voila, spending occurs. Folks, this is so important so vitally important that you will stop even wanting Medicare for all, you're going to want a national health service. You're not just going to want private, you know, you know, single payer. You're going to want free freaking health care, profit free health care. You're going to be sick and tired of hearing about people dying of cancer when you know our government could afford right now to spend crazy money crazy money solving cancer but we're dying that's what happens that's called austerity our veterans are totally foobar when they return to this country our kids are screwed up the rent's too damn high and the health care is too damn shitty. And we have built-in death panels called insurance companies that ensure that we don't live that long. 
I want you all to understand this whole ball of cheese is predicated on the neoliberal lie that we must pay for spending with our tax dollars. This neoliberal lie at the federal level is so pernicious, so disgusting, but so logical because after all, that's how your household budget works. So they tie that together into your heartstrings, into your brain pan. Now all of a sudden, They win. And then what happens? You got some dude named Bubba looking over somebody's shoulder at Walmart. Some bitch bought himself some crab meat with his snap card. Some bitch is getting over on the system. Get them damn people from the south out of here. Get, send the military down south. We got to keep them some bitches out of here. They're trying to take away our freedoms. Folks, answer this question. Think about this. I'm giving you this as homework assignment. Mental, you know, mental stuff here, right? What do you think a taxpayer looks like in the subconscious? Do you think a taxpayer looks like an elderly black man who is poor? in living on assistance? Or do you think a taxpayer looks like a white guy with an Audi or a Mercedes, hair greased back like mad men, going to Charles Schwab to check out his trades for the day? What do you think a taxpayer looks like in the subconscious? This taxpayer myth is racist as fuck. I'm telling you, they have planted it in our brains because the taxpayer myth keeps wealthy people at the top as always. Because anybody that wants anything free must be a never do good, a ne'er do good, right? Your veterans are suffering. Your kids are suffering with student debt. We're all suffering with shitty health care. We're all trapped in a employer's market that doesn't leave the kind of room for us to bargain, to better pay, to better conditions. This Sunday night message, folks, is for you to think about this as you go out there. We had a big blue wave, right? The Democrats took back over Congress. But out of all the people that were elected, there's like two of them that were legitimate progressives. Seriously. The rest of them, you know, pretty much corporate hacks. I want to tell you something else too, and this is the final thing for the night. I went to the uh, Economist for Peace and Security conference in Washington, D.C. on Friday. I got to see Stephanie Kelton. Um, she was very, very gracious and wonderful. Hi, Stephanie, if you watch this. Um, Bob Hockett of Cornell Law, who is a very good friend of mine, whom I love dearly, he was there. Jamie Galbraith. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's son was there. And Bill McKibben of 350.org was there. Um, and a host of other women and men, great economists. I got to meet Mirsa. I think it's Bera Darren, really, really sharp lady. I got to meet tons of people, really great. But one of the things that came out was from a former congressman from North Carolina named Brad Miller. And Brad Miller gave an epic talking point. I, I had no idea I was going to enjoy it. I was almost rolling my eyes when I saw it. I had no idea. But he raised the point about modern monetary theory. He also raised the point about how crazy his mind went 
from going from a state legislature up to Congress and how very different it was because in the state, when you came up with a bill, there was a good chance it was going to get passed and you were going to have to live with it. But when you're in Congress at the national level, people are not really doing the work like that anymore. There's think tanks writing these bills, massive think tanks everywhere writing these bills. ALEC, the Peterson Foundation, all these perverse and pseudo fake neoliberal horseshit are writing these bills. And these Congress people walk into a room with the index card in front of them 10 minutes before they go in there they read their three talking points they say them they go to the next room they read some other three talking points say them and that's it so we're putting all this stock in these candidates putting all of our hopes and dreams in these candidates but the reality is it's the think tanks it's these think tanks out there and we don't have a progressive answer for them. That's what real progressives wants to be. Okay? But when I talked to Brad, I raised my hand up. And I said, Brad Miller, can you tell me what role activists could play to help shift things? Because he said point blank that when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas, now, we all hate Bill, right? Everybody hates Bill. But when Bill was governor of Arkansas, he was dealing at a different level. He was trying to pass some bill about rainwater or water usage or something like that. And there was these two guys that were big-time rice farmers. And rice farming uses a lot of freaking water. So every single time you put this bill forward, the rice farmers would go in there and beat it down. Well, year after year, Bill Clinton apparently pushed this bill. And finally, Bill Clinton apparently picked up the phone and called these rice farmers up and said, hey, I'm gonna pass this damn bill one way or the other. And you guys can either help me write it and fix it, or I can just run it over your heads. They came together, worked it out, whatever, and did it. But that's not how it works at the national level, my friends. That's the thing. He's like, I was blown away when I realized what a different game it was. It's a real Game of Thrones between these factions, these lobbyists. There is no capitalist demand one way or the other for lobbyists. Lobbyists defy all rules of economics because they just fight for their cause, period. doesn't matter who's paying for it. There is no advertising, they, they just keep doing it. And that is how shit gets done in Washington. This is why getting money out of politics is so important. But these congressmen and women, these senators and stuff, they make great speeches, they say a lot of different things, but so much of what's going on is a direct result of think tanks, massively funded, heavily funded, very, very entrenched think tanks. The Washington Consensus. I say this to you because you put so much focus on these candidates and you yell and scream at them and, and it's bread and circuses. It's bread and circuses. And I don't do these conspiracies well because I don't buy conspiracies, but this is not a conspiracy. This is how it works. And we had it in the live stream. So maybe we can cut it up and put this part out there so you can hear Brad Miller do it directly because it was phenomenal. But it made me realize in that moment that you can either be an activist or you can govern. But the idea of being an activist and governing isn't working the same way. So you need help. You need help on the back side. You need these think tanks of our own that have our own interests at play. 
You need something more than just yelling and screaming. I understand the impulse to put your fist in the air. I understand the impulse to raise up the cardboard signs. We got to do it, right? That's what we got. But I'm here to tell you that we, these, these politicians, a lot of them aren't really deeply wed to ideology. They don't even have, they don't even have time to process it. Do you know how many people have no clue about the science behind half the bills they sign? And then where they're yelling and screaming that they signed a bill, they, they didn't even freaking know what it meant. They didn't even understand it. That's what's wrong with our government. This is what's wrong. And it's also why putting all of our hopes and dreams in the electoral system right now is probably the least effective use of our time. Movement building, educating each other. And not when I come at you, and I'm trying so hard, folks, I'm trying to retain both my rage and sort of dissipate the, the targeted blasts because I don't want to push you away. I want you to hear me because I'm telling you freaking important stuff. And I get angry. I'm not going to lie. I'm human. I get angry when people push back because I want you to, I'm one of you, man. I want you to hear me. But just like these Congress critters, you're yelling at them, you yell at me, and that's fine. I got broad shoulders to a degree, but there's a point where it's like, I want to be effective. The stuff I'm telling you is very important. At least I think it is. Real progressives thinks it is. We think you should think it is. We want you to pay attention. We want you to read. Because our weapon has got to be knowledge. It's the only way we're going to defeat them. We're not going to defeat them yelling at these friggin' props. We've got to know more. We've got to do better. We've got to really, really, really be smarter than the average bear. It is sometimes a curse. I swear to God, I think about this all the time. It is a curse to see this so freaking clearly and try to articulate things about the UBI or things about our currency, things about taxation, things about the way the electoral process works and say them and have such severe conviction and know the way it's laid out. And then have friends that you were trying to bring along because you need a unified front to kick some ass. And you're fighting amongst each other. That's what, that's what's so frustrating. Because you don't want to fight. You want to, you want to pull everybody together. You want to, you want to be in a huddle like, you know, a football team or whatever, really in it to win it together. I don't want to be fighting with you and I don't want you to be fighting with me. I want us pulling this thing together. It's the only way we got a chance. It's the only way we got a chance. So, anyway. I'm going to get off here. I'm going to wish all the veterans out there a wonderful day. Because, you know what? You are good people. You are Americans. You are human beings. You're whatever. We've got to do better so we can give you an alternative so that kids don't have to go in the military. We need a federal job guarantee to make sure that that's the employer of last resort, no longer having to go sell their bodies to the butcher machine and go fight in wars for markets. Folks, it's up to us. It's our job as progressives, as human beings, as the 99% to make this world the way we want it to be. And we need everybody, folks. That means, folks, get this. You're going to love me when I say this. I'm sure some of you will be really angry, but I'm telling you right now. That, who do you think is included in the 99%? Do you think the 99% is just people that wear masks and have their fist in the air? Or do you think some of the 99% might even have pussy hats on? 
Do you think some of the 99% might even have a Confederate flag on their shirt? Do you think some of the 99% may have a Malcolm X shirt or a Che Guevara shirt? I'm telling you right now, we have all been snowed. All of us have been lied to so much. And these hatred, the hatred we have amongst ourselves is a pitched battle to keep our eyes off the prize as they siphon away all of our labor, all of our value, all of our existence. They siphon it away as we sit there and eat each other alive, crabs in a barrel. Folks, I'm telling you right now, I feel it in my bones. We can do this. I've just, I'm going to work. See, I'm going to work to modify my delivery until you hear me, until we hear each other and we can move forward together. I'm going to modify whatever I have to because I want to be effective. I want you to hear me. All right. Please share this video far and wide. Please, if you can, donate to Real Progressives. We need help. We are trying to build those project management systems. We're trying to build those databases. We're trying to build the knowledge work so that we can fight this war. And it takes money. I'm not joking. I'm not a beggar, but I'm begging. We need money to do these things. We need it really, really badly. And we need volunteers that have real skills. We need volunteers that just have moral support. People that are sitting there that are not able to get a job that have a heart for this. We need you too. There's nobody left behind in this one. We need everybody, all hands on deck. And there's nobody, nobody that we can't find a use for at Real Progressives. We are not competing with parties. We are not a party. We are an organization building a movement. And I'm hoping that you'll come here and help us do that. I need your help. Folks, I need your help in the worst way possible. And when the road gets rough and you don't like something, I need you to choose not to quit. I need you to choose to keep fighting on because this too shall pass. I need you in it to win it, please. We need volunteers. We need people to share the word and we need money. If you got any, my God, we need it. I'm Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. Have a good night, everybody.